Chair, and thank you all very much for your presentations. Um, I think I, I will address my question to you, Ms. Valeriani. Uh, and if I might just begin quickly with uh, a couple of quotes. Um, so January 15th, 2018, McLean's Magazine titled, Marijuana Addiction is Real and Teenage Users Are Most at Risk. A survey conducted by the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse published last year found that a majority of youth were unaware that cannabis can be addictive and lead to withdrawal symptoms. Youth are better able to list what they consider to be the benefits of cannabis than the harms. Uh, Toronto Star opinion piece, 16 April 2018, an opinion piece by uh, the CEO of one of Canada's best residential youth addiction programs, quote, a large number of our clients tell us cannabis is their primary drug of choice. Many begin using it around the age of 12, and none believed cannabis was anything other than a benign substance. What could go wrong, they thought. He goes on to talk about the research that tells us a very different story, particularly in regard to adolescents, because their brains are still developing. Now, on your main page of your website, you have petition. Uh, and the subject aside of the petition, which is about the ongoing criminalization of cannabis dispensary workers, the very first line of the petition reads, and I quote, cannabis is a known medicine with minimal evidence for harms associated with its use. So what I'd like to ask you is could you help us understand, um, given we've all sat here and heard witness testimony, um, from the medical association, from the nurses, pediatricians, CAMI, a lot of witnesses here who have told us in no uncertain terms about the harmful effects of cannabis on the health of young people. So how do you begin a petition with that message? And you speak about the importance of listening to youth, and so I'd like to hear what you say. Absolutely. Okay, so first I would say that, um, you know, we would never advocate that cannabis use is benign, that there are certainly some risks associated with use. Um, we would also note that a lot of the evidence around harms remains inconclusive. Um, so under prohibition, we feel that a lot of the misinformation, this idea that cannabis is a benign substance, has been able to pro proliferate without any real um, kind of way to address those claims through evidence-based, sensible uh, conversations around cannabis. To address the petition, the petition was mostly in regards to the idea that the continued enforcement uh, around Toronto dispensaries was primarily targeting entry-level youth workers um, so that they were often left without any legal resources. Um, so in that regard, uh, that petition was more around that. Okay. Subject matter. Sure. But I am saying that we have heard in no uncertain terms that there is an evidence base of the harms of cannabis on the brains of youth okay. um, up until the age of 25. So I would like to, um, I'd like to kind of focus attention on a new study that actually was just released last week in JAMA Psychiatry. So JAMA Psychiatry is a very high impact and well-respected journal and they systematically reviewed 69 studies. Um, that looked at youth, cannabis use, and cognition. Their conclusion, if I may quote the study, says, associations between cannabis use and cognition functioning in adolescents and young adults are small and may be of questionable clinical importance for most individuals. Results indicate that previous studies of cannabis uh, use and youth may have overstated the magnitude and persistence of cognitive deficits associated with use. They also go on to say that after a period of abstinence of roughly 72 hours, most of those uh, cognitive deficits observed are reversed. Um, so, so this only speaks to cognition. They didn't look at other pieces such as, you know, mental health, with our, which are other kind of key depression. concerns. So they didn't, they didn't look at depression or psychosis or Yes, things exactly. Of that sort. So I, I have mm -hmm. copies of okay. the key points in the abstract, which I could also leave with um, the chair. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, there's, it's really important to consider also that a lot of the studies that we have around the harms of cannabis use, again, not saying that it's, it's completely 
risk-free, but they can't tell us about the direction of that relationship. They can't tell us the magnitude of that relationship or the strength. So I think it's really important to consider that oftentimes the harms that are experienced are really part of a kind of larger social and structural and environmental factors. So when we start considering things such as socioeconomic status and concurrent to alcohol and drug use, those associations tend to uh, get weaker. I'd just like to ask you one quick question, if I might, sure. because I'm sure I'm running out of time. Um, so if I could just ask about your education toolkit. Um, you partnered with Canopy Growth Corporation, a cannabis company, is that correct? Yes, it is. And what was the cost of that? What was the money they put into it? So the grant was $50,000, mm -hmm. and if I may clarify how we mitigated bias in terms of um, accepting money from Canopy. So, you know, we took um, steps. So first of all, it was an unrestricted grant. So I think that's really important to note that they had no hand in choosing the research team, in the development of the resources, in the messaging, in the design. We also had it reviewed by an external youth committee of three individuals who were outside of CSSDP, and then an external committee of nine experts in various uh, uh, realms to ensure that our literature reviews were reflective of the scientific evidence. So this included drug policy experts in Canada. It included uh, nurse practitioners from places like Sick Kids. It included educational consultants and parent uh, parent uh, groups that focus on drug use. Okay. Um, 